Okay, our next presentation is going to be about radiocarbon measurements on pearls. It'll be presented to us by Dr. Gregory Hodgins yes. uh, from the University of Arizona Accelerator Mass Spectrometry Lab. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here to speak with you. Um, just quickly, I'll do my acknowledgments first. Principally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Chen Wei Zhou, um, my colleague from the Gemological Institute, who um, asked me to get involved with radiocarbon dating pearls four or five years ago. And, and uh, this is a new research area for me and really uh, for the field in general. I also just want to give a shout out to Eric Fritz and Robert Downs, colleagues at University of Arizona. We have real strengths in um, chronometric methods dating with, with uh, inorganic materials, organic materials, and, and dating Earth systems. Um, and so my laboratory is an expression of that. And I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the staff of my laboratory in, in producing some of these measurements. So the origin of pearl dating is really actually quite recent, or, or the origin of pearl dating by radiocarbon is quite recent. And probably the best recent paper was by Michael Krasminicki and my colleague uh, in a radiocarbon laboratory in Zurich, uh, Irka Hajas. So these papers are starting to appear in the gemological literature and the literature in general, and I know it's outside of the experience of most of you, so uh, Chen Wei asked me to come and give you guys a, a kind of primer or introduction to radiocarbon dating, its complexities and its challenges with respect to dating pearls. So I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to talk about radiocarbon dating in terrestrial and marine environments, talk about it in freshwater environments, and then talk about um, the perturbation of the environment by above ground nuclear testing in the um, middle of the 20th century and how that affects pearls. So just really basic information, um, carbon has three naturally occurring isotopes, carbon-12 and carbon-13, and they are, one, are 99 and 1% of carbon in, in the environment. And carbon-14, the radioactive uh, isotope, it's uh, one part in 10 to the minus 12 compared to uh, carbon-12 in all of you in modern environments. Um, the radioactive element has a half-life of 5,700 years. We can measure uh, three orders of magnitude below down to 10 to the minus 15, and that represents about 10 half-lives. So the span of radiocarbon measurement is, is 45, 50,000 years. All right. So in other presentations, many of you are familiar with the use of isotopes in dating. These heavier isotopes, the origins of those found in rocks, are, they're often very long half-life elements. And the origin of them probably predates, for many of them, the actual origin of the Earth and the solar system. So that's one class of radioactive elements. The class that I'm talking about is completely different. It's a class called cosmogenic uh, isotopes. And those are ones that are being created all the time. And let me go over here. This is a description of, of the source of those things. I love this, this particular cartoon on the, on the left. Um, where's my laser? Here. So this is showing uh, the Earth's atmosphere basically from space down to the Earth's surface down here and even below the Earth's surface. And it's a, it's a, French, it's a French diagram, so altitude is calibrated in Eiffel Towers going up here. So, <laughs> so uh, there's the Eiffel Tower. This is Mont Blanc. This is uh, Mount Everest. And what it's actually depicting is the interaction between cosmic rays. So these are energetic particles that are produced in deep space, and they have large energies. And when those strike the Earth's atmosphere, they can damage um, atoms in, in the Earth's atmosphere. So a cascade of reactions happens when a cosmic ray comes in, damages some nuclei in the Earth's atmosphere, and then a, a cascade of other uh, damaging reactions happen. And the consequence of that is nitrogen, stable nitrogen, which is one of the most abundant gases in the, in the atmosphere, um, can be converted by neutron capture into carbon-14. So it goes from a stable element to an unstable element. And um, carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere oxidizes to carbon dioxide. And non-radioactive carbon dioxide is an element of our, or is a component of our atmosphere. So the two of those things mix. And, and it's obviously rare. So only a small portion of CO2 uh, is, is radioactive. But the atmosphere is incredibly dynamic. You all know from just watching the Weather Channel how much uh, the, the, Earth or the atmosphere circulates in three dimensions. And so the formation is way high up here in the stratosphere, but by the time it gets down to the Earth's surface, 
it's pretty much uniform in its concentration anywhere you are on Earth for all intents and purposes. Now what happens is that there's ama this amazing reaction, photosynthesis, and that's, that's where the inorganic carbon becomes organic carbon. Plants have this ability to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and make their tissues out of it. And that's one of the things I love about this field. It's this, it's this transfer of form of carbon from inert to living and then back to inert again and the cycling through that. So um, all living things in the environment become labeled with carbon-14 through this reaction of photosynthesis. So we can't do that, but we eat plants and we make our molecules out of plant molecules. So there's a kind of equilibrium within all, um, all of the biosphere here within a radiocarbon concentration within the tissues of living organisms and, and the environment. And then after things, if things, or when things die, if any components of their biologic, biological tissue survive, the C14 concentration in those tissues decreases just due to radioactive decay. And because that path is, is, um, is easily constrained mathematically, you can use as a chronometric, as, as a dating method, okay? So um, this is just a simple list of, of all of uh, the materials that we can radioactive date. Um, I've added pearls in here. As I say, pearls are a new thing to focus on dating, but um, many of these materials we have uh, 60 years at least of accumulated data on how to date these things. So radiocarbon dating is a very well established technique. Now, <clears throat> this is really just depicting the terrestrial environment. And my talk is focusing on pearls, and pearls are obviously in, in aquatic environments. And so there's a difference then that's going on. There's, in aquatic environments, we have a, or in terrestrial environments, we have this pool, the source of material is carbon in the atmosphere, gaseous carbon. And in the marine environment, obviously, it's a pool of carbon that's been dissolved into the oceans. And, the, and that moves into living things in the oceans by photosynthetic reactions of algae and diatoms and things that are living in, in the oceans. But they're pulling their carbon out of the water that surrounds them. Okay, so to talk about dating pearls, we're talking about dating oysters, and we have to talk about the pool of carbon that they have access to. And unlike the atmosphere, which is highly mixed and homogenizes C14 everywhere, oceans are, they're vast and they're slow mixing. And so that there is, are a lot of differences in the C14 content of ocean water geographically and through depth. And so this uh, simple cartoon here is showing a kind of conveyor belt of ocean circulation, all right? So the, the red ribbon is the surface ocean where it's warm, and that's the level that atmosphere is interacting with. So C14 that's made in the upper atmosphere diffuses down to the surface ocean, and it, it dissolves in the ocean at that level, on the red ribbon side of things. The blue, the blue ribbon, the blue side, are, represent ocean currents that as, uh, oops, that's fair enough. As, as water moves along the surface, there are points where it cools and dives down in deep, to the, to the deep ocean. And if you fo followed a packet of water here that had C14 recently dissolved in it, and were able to follow it and trace it throughout all of this loop, the completion of that cycle takes thousands of years. So the surface ocean here, and the organisms that live in the surface ocean, their C14 comes from newly dissolved atmospheric carbon that dissolved in the surface ocean, but it's also comprised of much older water that is coming back up to the surface at different points in this conveyor belt. And so the consequence of that is that the radiocarbon age of the surface ocean is about 450 years relative to, to the terrestrial environment. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? So, um, and, and oceanographically, the surface ocean is defined as the top 500 meters. Right, so if you're going to radiocarbon date marine environments, or organisms from marine environments, you have to understand that the starting C14 concentration in those ocean environments is lower than it is <coughs> in the terrestrial environment. And I know some of you are looking at that slide and saying, it can't be that simple. And it's not that simple. If you, here's another model of, uh, ocean currents here that is a little bit more sophisticated. And, but the other thing is, what do we care about the, the central ocean environments? For dating pearls, um, we're interested in, in the coast. 
And ocean circulation along coasts has got to be enormously complex because it's the interaction of water with, com uh, with the complex forms of the coastal environment. You have continental shelves that are changing depth. There's complicated bathymetry under there. So, and, and there's also seasonal changes in where water is coming from over time. So it's enormously complex because if we want to date um, oysters that are living somewhere in a coastal environment here, how do we know what the age of the water is that they're, they're living in? It's a complicated question, but it's actually not that hard to solve. And so really all you need to do is um, go to a particular location where you think you have, uh, where, where you have a, an old pearl that you want to date. Well, you need to know what is the age of the water that it grew in. So the way you could do that is actually just go there now in, 19, or in 2018, collect a bunch of mollusks from that location and radiocarbon date them. So the, the age of those things will tell you what the age of the ocean water is that they're bathed in. And that, that will allow you then to subtract that ocean age from an archeological pearl that you want to date. Does, does that make sense? You can correct for it if you know what it is today. Everybody got that? But from the mid 20th century, from above ground nuclear testing, the whole earth has been contaminated with C14. So the unfortunate consequence is you can't look at the contemporary terrestrial environment or the contemporary oceans to tell you what that offset is. Drat. All right? So, um, but there is a solution to that, and the solution actually comes from legions of intrepid Darwin wannabes that, that assembled natural history collections of shells and all sorts of uh, organisms and stored them in museums with known collection dates before the atomic age. So um, that's, that's the solution to this problem. And I'm, just, I'm going to illustrate how we, we've used that. Um, this was one of the first projects that Chen Wei brought to me. So here, there's a, a cache of 85 saltwater pearls. The information with, that was given to me was that they were harvested from the Caribbean islands and they were, they were possibly early 16th century. And Chen Wei's question was, would radiocarbon, what would, does radiocarbon say about that? Would it confirm or deny these, these givens? All right? So um, the pearls came from, reportedly came from Isle, uh, Kibagua, which is right here. It's, a, it's an island cluster that's just off um, Venezuela, all right? Um, Chen Wei allowed us to take uh, some blister pearls and we're going to destructively analyze them. So we took uh, 40 milligrams of material. We can handle sort of 10 to 40 milligrams of material. We powder it in a vessel. Uh, we hydrolyze it with acid and that acid hydrolysis liberates the carbon in the sample into, into gas in that vessel. We do some basic chemistry, we pull the oxygen off the carbon, and we make graphite out of it. So there's C14, C12, and C13 in here. The C14 uh, concentration is reflective of age. All of that carbon ele elements get put into graphite here, and that gets put into the accelerator mass spectrometer here. It's one sample in a wheel of 40, and we have a bunch of standards in there that define modern material. I don't have a great picture of the machine, but I can tell you it just barely fits in this room. So it's a very large piece of kit. You can't take it into the field. <laughs> and and um, so coming back over here for you guys. So we measure the amount of C14 in a sample. And then we, ca we convert that amount into a calendar age range. That's what radiocarbon dating is. And, and we do that by taking advantage of an enormous number of measurements that were previously made in our field probably 100,000 of measurements on known age objects before. So um, that blue curve is what represents this, our calibration curve. So we have the known age of, of those things and the y-axis is the quantity of C14 in them. So that's our calibration curve. We'll, we'll measure the amount of C14 in an unknown. That's what our machine determines and then we really just query the database and say, well, which samples in the database have the same amount of C14 as our unknown sample? And because the database ages are known, we can assign the age to the unknown by that correspondence. Okay? That's pretty easy. All right, so 
To date the pearls from this cache that Chen Wei uh, brought, we have to know what is the age of the ocean water in which the oysters lived in, but we can't use modern oysters because of above ground nuclear testing has contaminated the environment. So we have to use uh, natural history collections. And there's a tool that has been assembled by um, colleagues at Queen's University Belfast. It's, a, it's a, just a database query tool which allows you to place a pin on a location on the globe that you're interested. And what it does then is come back with a whole series of pins that represent locations where colleagues have dug into natural history collections of shells and measured the radiocarbon content of those. And those shells come from, as I say, natural history collections that have been previously uh, assembled. So I don't know if you can see this here, but, but there are uh, 10, 10 pinpoints around, around this island of Cubagua. And we have the literature reference, we have the, the year that the shell was collected, and we have the radiocarbon age of it. So here's one that was collected in 1935, and its C14 age was 490 years. So it kind of defines the offset of the ocean water it was growing in. So all, we, all I did is I took a cluster of shells that had been um, collected uh, 1935 to 1950 in this region, and, and basically average what the, the average age of the ocean water was around those and use that to correct for the, um, age, of the, uh, the age of the shells that we measured from Kebagua. Okay, so, so um, using the correction factor from measurements on Natural History Museum shells, correcting the radiocarbon age of the uh, Kebagua cache, we ended up with a corrected calendar age range of 1455 to 1615. So that's right on the money in a way. Do I really believe it? Well, the belief in it is dependent upon how accurate the information is that we were given. So this doesn't prove that the, the method works. It's not at that level yet, but it's, an, it's a very good start early on. Okay, what about freshwater environments? So. Carbon-14 in the atmosphere dissolves in water in freshwater environments just like it does in the oceans. And this is uh, uh, just a map of uh, oyster producing regions in Japan from a recent Gemin Gemology article. This, um, so uh, you can imagine atmosphere up here, it dissolves in water in rivers and it dissolves in water in lakes. And then oysters that are living in these systems pick up their carbon from that carbon-14 dissolved in the water. But what is, the, what is the sort of average age of the water in this system? Well, it's gonna be some balance between the rate of input from the rivers and the rate of outflow into the oceans. So it's gonna be variable depending upon where you're working. But it's probably not gonna be that, um, that old. So you may expect that there isn't gonna be much of, a, of an offset effect in, this, in an environment like this. But, um, there are circumstances where there is a large offset. And it, the circumstance is when the region you're working with uh, overlies a limestone geology. And limestone is calcium carbonate. It's the skeletons of ancient animals. They're so ancient, they, they contain carbon-14 at some point in time, but they no longer contain it. So in the hydrological cycle, rainwater percolates down, dissolves some of the limestone, or groundwater comes up, dissolves some of the limestone as, as bicarbonate, and through transport, that seeps into your lake or your river system. And that C14 free carbonate dilutes out some of the C14 uh, carbonate dissolved in the oceans that came directly from the atmosphere. So this input here can lower the mean C14 content of rivers and lakes compared to the terrestrial environment. And that's, so the challenge for working in freshwater environments is that um, they're highly variable depending upon local geology. So the solution for understanding these is the same as the solution for understanding it in a marine environment. What you actually have to do is you have to have collections of mollusks that grow within this river and lake system with known collection dates that you can measure the C14 concentration and understand how much older they were uh, compared to the terrestrial environment. Hope I'm not losing you guys, but um, so for radiocarbon dating saltwater pearls, we need to know the correction for the local ocean water we actually have a pretty good database already in place for that because we have a long history of people trying to date coastal environments. If you want to date freshwater pearls, you need to correct for the possibility of a hard water age effect, but there's no database that exists for that. And that's not to say it can't be assembled because 
the, the history of pearl dating is well known to many people in this room, the locations where they're grown, and so it should be possible to look for natural history collections or, or just hobby collectors or even people within the industry that have collected shells in the past so that we can establish what the reservoir age is in these um, river and lake environments. And the very last thing I want to talk about is, is this problem of bomb, atomic bomb derived carbon. So um, integrating this, the mushroom cloud. So we, above ground nuclear testing, testing happened from 1945 to 1963. And, and what's going on in the mushroom cloud, although you can't see it, the mushroom cloud goes up into the stratosphere and it's throwing off energetic subatomic particles into the air around it. And those things are interacting with nitrogen in the atmosphere just like cosmic rays were and they mediate similar reactions. They damage nitrogen-14 and turn it into carbon-14. And so this is, this is uh, atmospheric C14 levels over the time period from 1950 to 1995, it shows here. But it's showing you from 1955, which is when they started to develop hydrogen bombs. So these are ones that are really huge and they generated a lot of C14. The amount of C14 in the atmosphere between 55 and about 63 went up here to about 70%, 170% the natural levels. And this is a southern hemisphere curve so in the northern hemisphere. It almost doubled the natural amount of C14 in the environment. So on a bad day, I look at that, I think, well, this has basically screwed up my field forever. I mean, certainly for, for, for several thousand, this is a huge perturbation. There was a moratorium in 1963 against above ground nuclear testing. So countries moved underground and this creation of extra C14 in the atmosphere stopped. And what you're seeing here, this fall off is not because of radioactive decay. It's reflecting the fact that atmospheric carbon dissolves in the oceans. So the oceans have sucked all that out and they're removing all of that. And because of the slow o ocean circulation, that bomb derived C14 is now going down into the deep ocean and it's going to be bubbling back up at various points for the next 40,000 years. But um, on a good day, you realize that the rapid changes in C14 with calendar year across here makes us a very, very high resolution dating tool. All right? So um, we use this forensically for dating human remains or uh, wine or, or, I mean, I don't know, other, um, works of art, if you can detect elevated levels of C14 in them, they're definitively more recent than 1955, but with very high precision you can date things within the bomb peak. So this is a diagram from that 2013 paper where uh, Chris Manicki and Hajas point out that if you look at the history of uh, a cultured pearl industry over the 20th and, and 21st century, there are various um, time points here where there are technological or industrial developments. And they're trying to say that you may be able to tie these changes in, in pearl production to particular levels of C14 in the environment in which they happened. So the, the possibility there is linking these, these two things together. And um, this is a bit of a simplification because this is showing atmospheric C14 and the point of my lecture was to try to draw out the complexities of the fact that uh, pearls are growing in freshwater and marine environments and that changes things somewhat. So um, what we need is to produce a worldwide uh, map of age correction values for marine and freshwater environments. We need to understand how this bomb carbon is actually affecting pearl and oyster production. And what, wouldn't it be great if we could develop tools to develop pearl provenance from the pearls themselves so that if we had that locational information we could feed back that into selecting data for more accurate radiocarbon dating. And that's the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Gregory.